Ladies and gentlemen, I am Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It is August 26, 2022. This is your daily Ukraine update, and we are going to be breaking down just what is happening at the nuclear power plant. Why is Putin thinking he can somehow gin up 100,000 extra troops, and is Russia succeeding in their newly identified strategy? Let's get into it. First and foremost, there's really not been a ton of changes to the tactical map. We can see, first off, at Bakhmut, uh, no change to speak of to the front lines. These have pretty much settled, as we've discussed. The They're probably digging in. Russian strategy has generally been advance, consolidate, advance, consolidate, advance, consolidate. Uh, so that's probably what we are going to see here in the near future. The only major progress... Uh, that we've seen Russia make is down in Pisky, as we've discussed, uh, securing the capital city of their independent republic of the DNR is an essential uh, strategic objective. So incidental to that is, of course, going to be securing this airport that can be restored to military use if it can be fully secured. But the Russians appear to be trying to engage in some sort of flank, uh, possibly to try to seize this highway here, this M30, so that they can use it to move troops and equipment and give themselves a little bit of a corridor, given that it's a major route into Donetsk. Of course, to do that, they have to secure this town of Bisky. And as you can see, they've made some progress in the past couple of days. Uh, you can see they've been trying to make advancements and continue to contest Pisky by engaging in this flanking maneuver. It, On a tactical level, it seems risky to me, uh, flanking in open fields when the enemy's kind of dug in in this urban area, but it can be effective with the right sort of fire and maneuver. Of course, if they can flank and seize Pisky, they'll create a little salient here that they can potentially use to force the Ukrainians to withdraw, giving Donetsk a lot more breathing room. As you can see right now, the whole city is under Ukrainian artillery range, which would be a problem for the Russians. <laughs> Again, doesn't it's not a great look when you're independent country is subject to constant artillery bombardment by uh by the country that you know legitimately recognizes that it's actually part of their territory as unfortunately as always there's no movement in Kherson. um you can see uh again no news on the counteroffensive. um a small uh, that might even just be an error honestly but no real news in either direction on the Kherson counteroffensive. But as always, the real action, uh, when when the battlefield action slows, you can see the politicians ramp up, ramp up. So most notably, Putin has decreed that he is going to increase the size of the Russian military in January 2023. Uh, by 137,000 personnel. This is significant because it would, if he can do so, offset many of the losses they've likely taken in this conflict. Uh, but it's probably not going to happen. And the reason is because Russia has already been pulling out all of the stops to try to get their uh, additional combat power. We've seen them recruit some pretty sad looking 50 and 60 year olds uh some of whom don't appear to have much in the line of military service experience they're also trying to gin up more volunteer volunteer battalions recruiting from prisons uh this is usually the these are usually considered the last step for a country uh recruiting from these sort of sources the very old the very young prisoners and people who are otherwise um, would be considered unfit to serve in a forward combat unit. So you can put all you want on paper about increasing the size of your military, but the truth is, unless you have a mechanism to do so, i.e. like a draft, it's not going to happen. And this is just high-minded posturing by Putin. Uh, the other critical news that is really worth talking about um, the is that the Russian forces in Z, the the Zaporizhiva nuclear power plant uh, has apparently 
lost power temporarily. Um, and this is pretty worrying because the nuclear power plant, yes, it generates power, but it also requires power and it needs that power to come from a separate source. So about uh, there's a thermal power plant several kilometers from the nuclear power plant that provides it with sort of its operating power. And that was actually damaged and it was disconnected from the power grid and it meant that the diesel backup generators in the facility had to switch on in order to ensure that the facility had an orderly deactivation. Uh, again, it's not super clear to me that this power failure would have led directly to a nuclear incident, um, but it is dangerous that they are playing this sort of, of you know, deadly game with these very sensitive facilities. Uh, it's also really worrying. Of course, both sides blamed each other for the strikes. Um, but two points that I think are really worth pointing out. The first is that at the end of the day, Russia has worked hard to make this a to make this nuclear power plant a militarized target you can see in this leaked footage from the power plant uh you can see this is a power plant worker and he observes of course uh looks like about half a dozen russian military vehicles operating out of the plant now you can also see this is sort of corroborated by british intelligence who have identified Russian armored personnel carriers and military cargo trucks operating right at the plant's entrance. This probably tells us that the Russian forces are indeed treating this nuclear power plant as a military site. Uh, so what I would say they, I, I, I won't pass, I wouldn't pass judgment if Russia was to come in and say, listen, this isn't used for offensive operations. We have troops here because it's a sensitive site. They are only securing it. But if that were true, Russia would say that were true. And Russia might even go so far as to allow IAEA inspectors to enter the site, maybe even Ukrainian inspectors to enter the site, someone else to verify, yes, what they're saying is true. These are non-combat troops. They are just checking IDs at the gate and making sure that uh, any overly enthusiastic sabotage uh, doesn't happen at this very sensitive site. That would be the responsible thing to do. Uh, they have not done this uh, because it seems like they are, well, happy to have a site that Ukraine is not willing to put artillery into. and having a site like that can be very valuable right of course you can see uh august 18th iaa requested access to the site and of course the russians have denied this it's also though worth noting that you know this is just a dangerous game to play with a nuclear power plant. There really needs to be some sort of international agreement that both sides are going to cede it. Uh, though there's also worth noting that on August 20th, Russian officials indefinitely extended the order for Ukrainian employees of the power plant to stay home. And as far as we know, that order is still in effect, which is not what you want. You don't want the experienced operators of this power plant to be, well, sitting at home while Russian Amateur Hour tries to operate a nuclear power plant. Sounds like a recipe for disaster. Anyway, one final piece of news that is sort of interesting is that there has been a lot of conspiracy theories that have been put forward, or at least negative news stories, we'll say, about, Russia, about Ukrainian refugees in European countries. Right. This includes countries like Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Uh, and it's believed that while some of these stories are just sort of standard national nationalism, right? People just, hey, there's these people, they're different. Let me tell you a story about them being bad. Uh, 
But there's also a lot of evidence that Russian-backed sources are actually promoting these stories. To be clear, if you bring a million people into your country, there some of them are going to do some. Some of them are going to commit crimes because that's how human beings are. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you've you know put your country in grave danger by letting refugees in. Uh, so what Google is starting to do is try to actually pre-debunk uh, many of these bad faith arguments uh, by teaching people what appears to be uh, about logical fallacies, uh, you know, creating false choice or, uh, lo you know, yeah, false choice, other logical fallacies, straw men arguments, uh, and arguing from anecdote, all the sort of standard propaganda techniques that they use, that uh, misinformation uses to create sort of a narrative using uh, something that's either outright false or more likely using true stories that are not representative of reality. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me on this update. As always, of course, if you want to see some of the spiciest combat video breakdowns, the kind YouTube says I am not allowed to talk about and show on my channel, you want to become a member of the Patreon. Uh, thanks to my lieutenant tier patrons. You guys make this possible. Link is in the description. I'll catch you guys in the next one.